It's a real pleasure to, to welcome Yvonne, one of our esteemed professoriate, uh, who's going to deliver a fantastic, fantastic lecture. I want to spy you all. I've got a little biography to read out about, about Yvonne. So Yvonne graduated in biology from Strathclyde University in 1987, and her early career in the University of Glasgow was founded on her PhD studies in the CRC Beeston Institute, followed by postdoc studies in the departments of genetics, medicine and therapeutics, where she gained her transferable skills in transgenic technology to study disease mechanisms. Yvonne's interest in vascular disease continued with a move to University of Manchester as a lecturer, then rose to senior lecturer in molecular medicine before coming to Manchester Metropolitan as a professor in translational science in 2003. Yvonne is now the head of vascular pathology one of our elite areas that we're building around in the Centre for Biomedicine. Her research aims to understand vascular disease mechanisms and identify novel biomarkers of disease, contributing to patient stratification and application of personalised medicines. She is past chair of the British Society for the Cardiovascular Research and is current president of the European Vascular Biology Organisation. So Yvonne, please come and... Deliver your lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for the introduction, and uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming on this nice sunny, sunny afternoon. So, um, right, I was asked to do a talk on. Um, really, it's I'm going to start way back at the beginning when it all began in the era of recombinant DNA technology, and it was a very exciting time because in the early 80s genetically engineered insulin was approved for use in diabetic patients in both the US and in the UK. And my undergraduate final year project was entitled Removing the Control Elements from the TPL Gene. Now the tyrosine phenol lyase gene is an enzyme that was involved in um, synthesizing dopamine. And dopamine was the defective protein in Parkinson's disease patients. So we had the very aspirational uh, intention of generating dopamine and curing Parkinson's disease. Now surprisingly, in 2014, only 27 years later, the first clinical trials were carried out. Uh, and here you can see a PET scan of a brain. And these little yellow marks here indicate the presence of dopamine, which was um, published in The Lancet, which is one of the leading medical journals. And it shows the long-term safety and tolerability of ProSavin, and it was delivered by a lentiviral vector-based gene therapy approach uh, for Parkinson's disease. And this was a phase one and phase two trial. So it was very exciting to think, when I found this out, that I had started off in a project, and perhaps um, you know every little piece of the jigsaw in research goes towards a bigger picture. So that sort of started my interest in, um, and I should say, you know, 27 years later, to quote from one of our great leaders, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And I have to say that throughout my career, I've never lost enthusiasm for that uh, thirst for knowledge and uh, questioning how the human body works. And I think that's one of the keys to success for um, all the young investigators in the audience. So that uh, led me to my PhD in the Beetson Institute, uh, which is a cancer institute in Glasgow. And my PhD was on the differentiation of HL60 cells into monocytes and macrophages. Now, HL60 cells are a leukemic cell line. And um, this uh, posed the question, how do cells become deregulated in disease, or in this case, in cancer? And so if we think about the bone marrow, which is where all the mesodermal stem cells and um, leukemic cancer cells start, these cells become uh, induced to a different cell type, namely hemangioblast. And then they differentiate into all the other different um, uh, blood cells. So this is the, called the hematopoietic system, and these are hematopoietic stem cells that go into red cells and white cells. And they become specialized in, specified into these different uh, types of blood cells. And so my PhD was really looking at why in cancer these leukemic cells got blocked at this stage and why they couldn't differentiate. And that thread of cell changing their phenotype has led throughout, has been sort of prominent throughout my whole career. 
which I'll come on to during the course of this talk. So um, it was still at this stage at the early 90s when gene therapy was a real buzzword. And I was fortunate to work in the lab of, um, who is now Professor Rosemary Ackhurst over in ca uh, California. And we set about looking at a single gene disorder, namely haemophilia B, where these patients are defective in the protein factor 9. And it was thought that by replacing the defective factor, uh, factor 9 gene, we may be able to cure a haemophilia. Very aspirational again. So uh, the concept was that if we could uh, perhaps design some type of a patch, because nicotine patches were just being invented in those days, and uh, put this in the arm of a patient and get the gene uh, expressed or delivered in the skin cells and then secreted into the blood circulation, Perhaps this would uh, go some way to improving haemophilia. So I said about making a gene construct, what is called a gene construct. This is linking up the factor IX gene, which is the defective gene in haemophilia, with a skin cell promoter. Now, the promoter of a gene is like the driver of a gene. Um, it drives the expression or synthesizes the gene. And these other little stabilizer elements were put onto the gene construct as well. This is a bit like taking a smashed up mini Cooper and taking a very zooped up engine to make it better, like the engine of a Porsche, and putting it in and adding a nice paintwork and nice accessories, and you end up with a very zooped up Mini Cooper, which is a very desirable little car. So we set about making a transgenic mice, and uh, sure enough, we were able to express this gene, that, this protein that's normally expressed in the liver in the skin of mice. And this section shows these little blue cells here. This is called a reporter gene, and it allows us to track the foreign gene expression. So we could see that the gene was being expressed in the skin. And then this graph shows the levels of the factor IX protein in the circulation of these mice. So this was very exciting, that we could actually engineer the expression of factor IX in skin and get it secreted into the circulation. But as you can see from this bar graph, these three lines of mice have very different levels of, of factor IX in the blood system. And this was telling us something. It told us that the gene, the location where this gene was inserted into the genome had a big role to play in the level of the expression of that gene. And now, 20 years on, this technology has moved on and we've now got a, a technology called CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and that allows us to insert genes correctly in the exact point of uh, the genome where we want it to go, and we can also edit out the faulty genes exactly where we want, want them to be. And uh, so it just shows you over the course of 20 years or each decade, there is some new technology, uh, technological breakthrough. So this was quite exciting in those days, and, but, but this was a transgenic animal. The next question was, how are we going to deliver this into the patient? And I was fortunate to uh, come across Brian Bellhouse, who was a senior fellow in Magdalen College at Oxford. And I spent a very nice visit in uh, Brian's lab. He was constructing this device. It was a gene gun. Now, it was a very large contraption, as you can see. And he was working on plant cells at the time. Now, plants have a very coarse chlor chloroplast um, co covering. And it's very difficult to get DNA into plant cells. So he was designing this a uh, pressurized gene gun. You can see here that the pressure comes down this pipe here. And we were coating d d uh, tungsten particles with DNA. I said, well, instead of plants, could I bring my mice? And uh, could we try injecting the mice with this pressurized gene gun? And uh, so here you see the little mouse on the platform, which is in here. You can't really see it very well. But at the, on the back of the mouse, you can see the little black uh, circle where these tungsten particles have been delivered coated in DNA, and here you see the cross-section. I've taken, removed the skin from the back of the mouse, made a cross-section, and again with this reporter gene, this little blue gene, uh, you can see the expression of the foreign gene in the skin. So again, that was very exciting, and although uh, this project finished, um, uh, no, but Brian went on to develop, instead of this great big large piece of equipment, he went on to design a smaller um, pressurized chamber and it became a sort of needle-sized injection syringe. 
and it became even smaller um, over the next decade into nano nano-sized uh, microinjections. And you can see this little puncture in the skin, which is only 20 microns across. So um, Brian went on to create a spin-out company in Oxford uh, called Powderject Pharmaceuticals. He co-founded this company in 1993. And six years later, he sold it to Chiron Vaccines for 542 million. So all the entrepreneurs shouldn't lose faith and should if they have some good ideas. Now, I got none of that money, but again, it was very nice to be part of a project that went on to be so successful. Um, so at this stage, um, I was sort of thinking, instead of going for a single gene disorder, maybe we should go larger and go into uh, more acquired diseases. Um, and people were working on um, multifactorial diseases like cancer and AIDS and cardiovascular disease. And it was at this stage, uh, um, that my father sadly passed away prematurely from heart disease and that triggered my interest in moving into a cardiovascular disease arena. And so that really started the, um, the, the start of my, um, in the early 90s, uh, my cardiovascular career. Um, so I was still interested in gene therapy and went to work in the lab of Professor Anna Dminicek, uh, who is a hypertension physician. And again, in 1992, nitric oxide was voted the molecule of the year. And so Anna sort of said, well, since you're interested in gene transfer, why don't you take this enzyme which synthesizes nitric oxide, namely the endothelial nitric oxide synthase gene, transfer it into a hypertensive rat model. And um, uh, before I go on to that, uh, that study, in 1998, uh, Fertko, Ignaro, and Murad actually won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the properties of nitric oxide. So it was very nice to be working at the sort of cutting edge of uh, these very exciting molecules and, and uh, events uh, in my sort of early career. But so we decided to work with Enos to generate nitric oxide to see if we could improve the function of blood vessels. But again, when it came to thinking about how are we going to deliver this in the patient in the clinic, we have two options. We either deliver it directly into the patient, into the patient's perhaps into their patient leg if the leg is ischemic and hasn't got much uh, oxygen from their blood vessels. Or some patients undergo uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. And to do that, uh, uh, in some clinics, they take the saphenous vein from the patient and use that as the conduit article, uh, artery for um, the bypass. So we could take the artery, uh, the saphenous vein, out from the patient, perhaps manipulate it outside the body and put it back into the patient and then prevent the onset of restenosis, which might occur in bypass surgery. And at this stage, viral vectors were also being, deliver, uh, being developed for delivery of DNA into cells. And so I used an adenoviral uh, gene delivery system, used this ex vivo approach. And here we have human veins that have been transfected with, um, a, again, a, a, an adenovirus encoding this reporter gene that allows us to look at gene expression and track where it's being expressed. And you can see the little blue dots in the vein. This is a control one that's just been injected with a fluid without the test gene. And you can see the blue layer along the endothelial layer. So again, this was very exciting that we could transfect human veins with a foreign gene and get expression. And so we wanted to see whether this would be functional in, a, in an animal model. And so we took a hypertensive stroke-prone rat model, exposed the carotid artery, and then infused the therapeutic gene, namely our ENOS gene, into the rat model. And here you can see the control. This is just a normal vessel, cut in, uh, cut, a section cut through a blood vessel. And here you can see, again, our reporter gene showing us the expression of this foreign gene along the endothelial layer and in the adventitial layer, which is the outside of the blood vessel. And in this one, you can see, if you can see a little brown layer, this shows the actual ENOS gene. And so we, um, uh, and again, in the adventitia. So this was very, very exciting for us. And in this section, you can see all these little red dots represent superoxide, which is a free radical, which is not very good um, and, and why it's very high in the hypertensive rat. You can see in the normotensive rat, it's present at a much lower level. Well, when we put in the ENOS gene, 
the nitric oxide and the superoxide works in a sort of balance, and we could reduce these this superoxide, but more importantly, we could improve the function of the vessel. When we looked at the contractility, this is the contraction of the vessel using a hypertensive animal. When we infused the ENOS gene, we can improve the contractility almost to norm normal levels. So this was very exciting, and we published quite a few papers on this, and uh, won the odd little prize. And it was at this time that uh, gene cloning was very much into the fore. And maybe some of you might remember, um, probably a lot of you are too young to remember Dolly the sheep, but it was very exciting. Um, sadly, Dolly didn't actually turn out to be as uh, f fruitful as people had first thought. She died prematurely. That's another story. Uh, the media were also, there was also books coming out like designer genes and the front of covers of uh, magazines were coming, changing your genes. And really the media honed in and um, gene therapy started to get a very bad press because the gene therapy clinical trials that were being carried out were being carried out in terminally ill patients because everybody was still a little bit cautious about putting foreign genes into people. And so they were carried out in these terminally ill patients, so of course they were going to die. But the newspapers and um, the media took hold of this and said that gene therapy was really not very good. And um, the scientists that were working in this area were really cowboys and they were trying to design designer babies and so on. So it went through a little bit of a lull um, and it was recognised that for this to move on, we would really have to think about genetic therapeutics in combination with current clinical pharmaceuticals. And there really needed to be a greater understanding of disease at the molecular level. Even the societies that were formed then, I was a founder member of the British Society for Gene Therapy and the European Working Group for Gene Therapy. They then changed their names to the uh, gene and cell therapy groups because there was a recognition that a single gene being transferred into patients probably wasn't going to really work. Now, if we look at the cardiovascular st uh, disease statistics, cardiovascular disease is still on the increase. Um, it's the UK's biggest killer, and it's not just in the UK, but it is a real global problem. Um, it's, uh, it's also a huge cost burden on the NHS and uh, uh, at the EU scale as well. So we've got a global problem of unmet clinical need. So this kept my interest in cardiovascular disease at those stages. And in 2000, I moved down to Manchester to the Cardiovascular Research Group in the University of Manchester under the leadership of Tony Hegarty. And again, um, it was sort of still, I, uh, Tony is also a hypertension physician interested in endothelial function and blood pressure um, control. Uh, but, but my interest really was understanding why the endothelial layer, um, when it's the first line of defense, how it cross talks to the smooth muscle layer and how our uh, blood vessels build up this layer of fat, and then further on, as it progresses, it gets calcified and becomes very hard tissue. And so again, the question was, how do the cells change their phenotype from a normal blood vessel through this fat uh, clogged up vessel into a calcified artery? And again, this is a theme that has run through sort of the work. So it, it allowed me to set up an independent, this is really, I suppose, the start of my independent um, research career where I was looking at vascular damage and repair, uh, the discovery of sort of biomarkers, biomarkers were coming, becoming of uh, interest at this stage, and just basic academic vascular cell signaling, trying to understand um, how cells talk to each other. So I'm gonna run you through these three, three themes um, fairly quickly. But let's start with the discovery of biomarkers and what a biomarker is. Well, this is a schematic of a blood vessel. And here we have the endothelial layer, which is, as I say, lining the blood vessel where the blood runs through here. And we've got our smooth muscle layer and our adventitial layer. Now, when we get an inflammatory um, insult or maybe a hormonal change or something, uh, the endothelial layer uh, loses its integrity and it loses its protective mechanism of uh, restoring uh, the integrity of the blood vessel. It also increases the permeability, so things can pass from the blood into the vessel wall, and it increases its inflammatory cytokines. So a biomarker is really a conveyor of information, and it can be an effector of disease as well. So a lot of diagnostic blood tests were being developed, both for predicting heart, uh, heart attacks and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, 
most of the uh, cancer work is looking at um, biopsies and localised uh, localised proteins in tissue, but we've also been fortunate to get um, ethics approval to use some patient tissue, and we can look at plaque proteins within um, within tissue, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But for the most part, we're looking at circulating proteins and cells and, and microparticles in blood samples. And so these biomarkers that are circulating in the blood can tell us, can predict disease, they can tell us about the diagnosis of disease or the stage of the disease. We can look at the effect of treatment uh, and the treatment efficacy and the side effects and the disease progression, all from, uh, from a, a sample of blood. So we decided to look at biomarkers and focus in on a couple of diseases. And the first disease I'm going to talk about is the atherosclerosis carotid disease. Now the carotid artery is the artery that leads up to the brain. And you have a right and a left, uh, an internal and external carotid artery. And sometimes this carotid artery, where this bifurcation occurs, gets clogged up with this plaque or fatty material. And when this happens, sometimes some patients have to go for what they call a carotid, carotid endarterectomy, when the surgeon opens up the carotid artery and scrapes out this plaque and fatty material, and then leaves the, uh, stitches up the artery and leaves the lumen quite free of this fatty material. Now, this is the plaque tissue that we uh, sometimes get uh, to analyze. And we can look at blood vessels within that tissue and ask, why do these vessels stay in positive for the marker that we're looking at, and these vessels stay negative? And so it begs the question, there's some distinction. Is one of them stable and one of them leaky? Um, and is it the leaky vessels that go on to leak blood into the brain and cause a hemorrhagic stroke? So if we can understand these signaling processes and, and these molecules, then perhaps we'll be able to do something about it. The second disease that we're interested in is the blood vessels in the leg. Now, this is peripheral arterial disease, and again, these arteries in the leg get built up with this fatty plaque. And if this goes on too long, sometimes it results in death of the leg, the limb, the lower limb, and it has to be amputated. And again, if this happens, we get the blood vessels from this tissue, and we can take a cross-section of the blood vessel. And you can see here that this vessel has started the formation of this plaque, the lumen, this lumen where the blood flows through the vessel has started to decrease. And you can see the red round here. This is all the calcification that occurs in these vessels. And again, when we take a high magnification and look at the blood vessels, we can see all these little blood vessels that are staying positive. There's other vessels in here that are negative. And so it allows us to look at these, um, the, the distinction between these vessels. Now, one of the complications of diabetes is diabetic foot ulcer. Um, foot ulcers, and this is a clean ulcer, I have to add. Um, and uh, in 2014, uh, there was a, an article from um, Harvard Medical School looking at the transplantation of these mononuclear cells for lower limb ischemia to try and prevent this. Now, um, I'll come on to this because this is one of the areas that we've been sort of interested in as well. But this is, let's look at the sort of checkpoints in a disease. So we know that during the day um, when, we've, uh, when we get hungry or when we're tired, when we waken up in the morning, the proteins in our blood um, fluctuate. Now, if they stay between these two lines, that means that we're in a state of good health and we just have to eat and then we'll not be hungry, we just have to sleep and we'll not be tired. Now, um, when, this, when the proteins, certain proteins in the blood rise above this level, it means that uh, we are, we're not so well. Now, it might be just a common cold, and our body has a great inherent capacity to repair itself. So we get over the cold, and that's fine. We can stay healthy. But if some of these proteins rise to a higher level, these are the early biomarkers of disease. And this, it's at this stage that we want to prevent the onset of further disease progression. So we, we try to sort of look at what's causing this whether we can prevent it. And there's a lot of good pharmaceutical um, drugs on the market that can prevent the onset of further disease. But when we get to this higher stage, the late onset, um, um, these biomarkers, this is an irre irreversible stage. So we really don't want it to get to this stage. So what we're trying to do is look for uh, early screening kits and early diagnostic kits um, to try and understand what's going on and what triggers the mechanism to uh, trigger disease. 
Now, we know that everyone is unique, and some people have a greater susceptibility to disease than others. Some people are more resistant to disease than others, and everybody's response to therapy is very different. And so I'll come back to that point um, later on. But we have looked for, at a lot of different proteins in different uh, groups of patients. Uh, we've used what we call a bioplex assay that screens a lot of proteins. We've used ELISAs. And there are a number of proteins that are elevated in patients with disease. And we show, they show a lot of elevated inflammatory markers. Now, that's not a surprise, because if we have inflammation, we will have disease. We have published widely on a lot of different signaling molecules. I'm not going to go into them all now. But we have a lot of biomarkers that are raised in disease. But really, what is that telling us? Is it telling us about the individual patients or not? So we have a lot more probing to do on these different pathways that we're studying. At this same time, in parallel, imaging um, technology has moved at a rapid rate. And we're now getting much more sensitive, non-invasive imaging um, modalities that we can use in the clinic. And you can see here, this is a cross-section of, um, or this is a, a, an image of a, a scan, where you can see this little white curvature. Now, that's a very heavily calcified artery. So that patient isn't going to do very well. But it allows us to gather a lot of information non-invasively about the health of the inside of our body and the health of our blood vessels, perhaps. So ultrasound imaging we've all heard about. We can tell the health of our carotid arteries in our neck just by simply ultrasound. And the radiographer can read these scans and tell us whether we've got a lot of plaque or no plaque. And uh, hopefully it'll be no plaque. And in the about 2003 or 2004, um, I um, started a very fruitful collaboration with Ian Bruce, who is a um, professor of rheumatology uh, in the MRI and is the director of the Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Facility. And although Ian is a rheumatologist, he's very interested in the fact that these rheumatoid patients and lupus patients have elevated cardiovascular risk compared to others. And so we, uh, we've sort of had a very, as I say, very fruitful collaboration where we're looking at the vascular problems in these patient groups. And Sarah Skew was a young, um, is a young uh, clinical fellow uh, who did a PhD in the lab, and her interest is in imaging. And so Sarah has, uh, you can see here, these are scans of carotid plaques, and you can see the yellow areas. Now, this indicates inflammation. And if we see plaques with this elevated level of inflammation, it's telling us that it could be these patients are more susceptible to plaque rupture and a future cardiovascular event like a heart attack or a stroke. Um, so uh, this is quite exciting work. And another clinical fellow that uh, did a PhD in, in my lab was Ben Parker, who's now a consultant in the MRI, also a rheumatologist. But Ben was interested in flow-mediated dilatation as an imaging modality to look at endothelial function. And this tells you the health of the whole blood vessel, be it in the arms or the legs. You can see this little blue area here is the buildup of plaque in this vessel. So again, we have published a lot in combination with imaging modalities. Um, and Sarah, incidentally, got her work published in The Lancet, which is, again, the leading medical journal. So there's a great interest in combining imaging with these bi uh, uh, biomarkers in the blood. And we have been able to show that by reducing inflammation uh, in these rheumatoid patients, this, um, this rheumatoid group that is normally classed as an inflammatory disorder, but have elevated cardiovascular risk, that if we reduce inflammation, we can perhaps pr uh, protect against atherosclerosis. And I'm very, very pleased that um, uh, now to have joined up with Fiona Wilkinson, a colleague, where we're continuing with this um, work, where we're trying to combine imaging um, uh, uh, and develop a chip modality where we're looking at not just one protein, but a range of proteins in the blood and microparticles in the blood, and be able to perhaps detect stroke susceptibility in, a, in particular patients. Decide whether these patients uh, can be stratified into those that have stable plaque or vulnerable plaque, and perhaps then inform the clinicians whether they should have the best medical therapy or whether some should undergo carotid endarterectomy interventional surgery. So by combining these imaging and biomarkers, we can then stratify patients at risk of stroke. So this di diagnostic device, which perhaps will be developed in the future, will be able to take different disease phenotypes like diabetes, coronary artery disease, 
perhaps some endocrine problems or metabolic problems, look at early, progressive or severe cases of disease, and then through this panel that we have identified and these proteins that we've identified, perhaps then stratify these patients even further. And uh, we can uh, then have an association of immune markers with a specific disease phenotype. Combining this with genetic information and perhaps using a gene chip to understand the genetic um, makeup of these people, we will be able to use these technologies uh, and identify circulating biomarkers that will correlate with disease risk and translate this into clinical practice, improve patient outcome, and ultimately minimize NHS costs. So that's the biomarker story. Moving into the sort of vascular cell signaling story, I talked about um, the bone marrow having mesodermal stem cells. If we think of stem cells being um, having a choice like a pinball, you sort of pull back the anybody that's worked uh, used a pinball machine, you don't really know where these balls are going to go. And um, stem cells are a little bit like that. They have decisions to make. They have to, I sort of talked about the hierarchy earlier on, where they become induced to one, a different type of cell. And then when they make that decision, whether to go right or left here, they have another decision to make, whether to become one cell or another. And if these stem cells make the right choice, we all stay healthy. Now, under certain circumstances, if these cells make the wrong choice, that uh, forms the disease and the pathology. And so by understanding these signal points and these signal molecules, we'll perhaps be able to understand how cells distinguish between the health and disease. And one of the complications of atherosclerosis or buildup of this plaque is calcification, as I've mentioned. Here we can see an artery that's got a lot of fatty material and a lot of calcified material in here. Uh, this is a real problem in the clinic for surgeons in particular, and it occurs in a lot of different cardiovascular disease phenotypes. And here we've got a cross-section, again, of a blood vessel with a lot of plaque here. A lot of this red is, we've stained it for the presence of calcification. Now, um, here you can actually, you don't need fancy imaging modalities. This is a plain x-ray, and you can see the little white arteries here where the arteries in the hands have become calcified. And this graph shows the survival um, outcome of renal patients who have undergone dialysis. If they have a calcium score at a very low, below three, um, their chances of survival um, up to five years after dialysis is good. If these patients have a calcium score higher than three, then for some reason or other, their prognosis is not very good um, uh, for um, a five-year outcome. And so the renal physicians talk about calcification being, you know, if you've got the survival gene, you will do well. If we could only understand what that survival gene is, then we would be making some progress. But in order to try and understand what genetic makeup and what genes are involved in the process of uh, vascular calcification, we've got a very nice in vitro model that allows us to look purely at one uh, population of cells, these smooth muscle cells. And so what we do is we take the tissue and we, uh, we take uh, the artery that's heavily calcified. Some of them are calcified and some of them are non-calcified. We isolate the smooth muscle cells from this tissue. And you can see here that when we put them into osteogenic conditions, some of these cells form bone. This, these little red marks here indicate the presence of bone-like materials. And when we look for the expression of um, proteins in this, all these proteins are the proteins that are uh, associated with our skeleton. So it's a real, so we're beginning to understand at a molecular level, and um, there are very few laboratories working on the genetic and the cellular aspects of vascular calcification, and we are one of them. So um, it's quite a very, uh, it's quite a neat area to work in. Um, and it's, uh, you can see here that uh, when we're looking for therapeutic targets, you can see here the white uh, coronary artery, which again is heavily calcified, and again x-rays in the feet, you can see the little calcified arteries here. So what are the targets that we're looking for in order to prevent this devastating disease? Well, we're looking at these calcifying vascular cells that occur that change their phenotype in the vessel wall to become bone cells, and we're also looking at the local proteins that are circulating in the blood to see whether we can prevent the secretion of these or to prevent the sort of cascade of events that occurs when these um, hit the cells. So our working model of calcification, we have activated endothelial cells in disease. They secrete 
damaging molecules that cross talk to the smooth muscle cell in the vessel wall. And then the smooth muscle cell downregulates the smooth muscle cells and upregulates the bone cells and becomes a bone cell. And then it differentiates into this bone cell and deposits this mineralized matrix. And so I am again very pleased that um, my two colleagues, Fiona Wilkinson and Rhea Weston, um, are carrying on with this work in vascular calcification. And we have got a few projects on the go where we're trying to um, dissect out some of the pathways that are involved in this and trying to um, develop new therapeutic um, um, agents. So finally, um, the vascular damage and repair aspect. Well, isn't it curious that when we have a skiing accident or perhaps fall off a horse in horse riding accidents, we damage our bones, break our bones, but within a couple of months, we are back to fighting fit again. And we have no after effects of this bone, um, severe bone break. So doesn't that pose the question, if our bones can do this, why can't our blood vessels do it? And how, what, what cells are involved in doing this because we're not taking tablets and we're simply just waiting for our bodies to repair the broken bones. So this brings us back to a developmental process. We all start from a single e fertilized egg cell and during the course of nine months, this single cell becomes all the organs in a body and we have the, the, the birth of a beautiful little baby. And looking at it from a scientific point of view, this fertilized egg divides into two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16, and so on. And we have the formation of what we call a blastocyst. And these pluripotent, these are embryonic pluripotent stem cells. And they make up the three layers in the body. We have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. The ectoderm make up the skin and the nerves and, and some others. The mesoderm make up the heart and blood vessels. And the endoderm makes up the lung and pancreas. Now, I'm interested in the mesodermal stem cells that make up the heart and blood vessels. And going back to my earlier slide, when I was doing my PhD and we were looking at the hematopoietic, the blood cell system, we've got the same system here, bone marrow cells, mesodermal stem cells becoming hemangioblasts, but this time, in 1997, Asahari in Japan discovered that there were not only blood cells there, but there are angiogenic cells. There were populations of cells in the blood that made up the endothelial, cell, uh, endothelial layer. These are called angioblasts. Now, there are three different populations of uh, angioblasts. I'm not going to go into that now, but these are endothelial progenitor cells. These cells become committed and differentiated and then specified into arterial endothelial cells or vein endothelial cells. And although they're both endothelial cells, they have very different characteristics. One takes blood away, one brings blood back to the heart. And so they have different characteristics, as I say. So um, when we think about how the endothelium is damaged and how it repairs itself, the body has a great sort of balancing mechanism. Now, sometimes apoptosis is a sort of death pathway, and regeneration is the cells regenerate and, and repair the damage. Now, when the cells get hit with an inflammatory or some kind of hormonal or endocrine insult, the cells undergo this death process and gets damaged. However, uh, they release these cytokines and these little microparticles, and that triggers a signal for these endothelial progenitor cells to come in into the circulation and repair the damage. Everything's fine. In disease, however, this balance is upset. And so we get an increase in this death program we get an increase in these molecules, but somehow or other, the endothelial progenitor cells are reduced in number and they are reduced in function. And so this is part of the uh, work in the lab. We're trying to understand these endothelial microparticles and what they carry and these endothelial progenitor cells and what triggers their repair process. So we're asking the question, do these endothelial progenitor cells reflect disease status? Um, and uh, here we have a damaged endothelium. They've got low levels of EPCs. When we take statins or physical activity and so on, the EPC levels increase. So uh, staying with the sort of cardiovascular diabetes is one of the problems, growing problem, big uh, growing, um, uh, growing costs. One of the complications is diabetic foot ulceration. As I've mentioned, this is one of the areas that we're interested in delayed wound healing, and we're asking the question, is this poor vessel growth? 
So how do these cells communicate with each other? Well, looking back, John Rell was another rheumatologist and another clinical fellow doing a PhD in my lab. And he was looking at these circulating angiogenic cells and these repair cells. Just let's see if I can make this work. And so these cells, they are attracted to an endothelial network in the, in, the, uh, in the dish in vitro. And so this is an endothelial um, assay that we've got to look at the function of endothelial cells. Now, if I put this picture up, you can immediately identify which continent these people come from by the color of their skin. If we put cells in a dish, we can also identify where these cells come from by the surface markings on their membrane. So we can identify these endothelial progenitor cells as distinct from heart cells or smooth muscle cells and so on. We can also sort these cells by a process called um, flow cytometry, where we take a blood sample, load them into a sort of gradient, and label these cells with the markers that we now know belong to different cell types. And the cells are differentiated by their size and their fluorescence. Now, on top of their um, markers, uh, on the surface of the cells, they also have these sugar strands. Now, these are called polysaccharide molecules or proteoglycan complexes, and these are also signaling molecules. They act like a mop. They soak up all the growth factors that are outside the cell, and they can squeeze them out and release them as well. So th this is the, uh, this is a, a, you can see the glycocalyx. This is a, a transmission electron micrograph, where you can see the furry little glycocalyx on this endothelial cell, and this is a schematic. Now, this is um, a, a diagram of the heparin sulfate chain that makes up these, uh, these sugar strands. And this is a very important signaling molecule. Here you can see these little sugar strands in between the cells. And this is telling us that these cells are communicating with each other. Now, we know in disease that these, these little communication systems break down and um, uh, they're impaired. And so a paper came out showing that heparin sulfate mimics inhibit HGF MET activation. Now, this was one of the pathways that we had identified in our earlier studies um, as a biomarker of disease. And so uh, I came back, and fortunately at that time, Alan Jones was a chemist here in MMU, who's now moved to Birmingham. But he synthesized these glycobometric compounds for us and uh, did some docking pictures and, and showed us where they, where they bound to the um, uh, uh, hepatocyte growth factor molecule. And when we put these glycomimetics into a mouse model, here you can see a very damaged vessel that has no contractility at all. Here you can see uh, the, lower, the lower line is where the vessel is normal and it's contracting very well and relaxing very well. When we put our glycomimetics in, you can see that it's restoring that damage. And in this case, it's restoring it right down to normal. So these glycomimetics that we have synthesized um, are very exciting. We've also looked at this stage, the, um, there's little organelles within our cells called mitochondria, and they're the energy powerhouses of the cell. And they give us the energy. And we've looked, um, uh, we've got a very fancy piece of equipment that allows us to look at metabolic activity in these mitochondria. Um, and so Alex Langford-Smith, a postdoc in the lab, has done some very nice work and has been able to show that these diabetic endothelial progenitor cells that are circulating around have a higher metabolic activity than healthy controls. So they're having to work so much harder to generate energy. And so it may be that these cells are defective in this way um, uh, in diabetes. So what we believe is happening is these progenitor cells, these repair cells, isolated from the blood from diabetic patients are defective, but they possibly can be um, improved by these glycomimetic uh, compounds that we're working with. So we have the endothelial damage. They release cytokines. They release um, extracellular vesicles. These are our biomarkers. They mobilize the cell from the bone marrow. Then they, these cells home to the damaged site in the blood vessel and repair the damage. But in diabetes, the migration is impaired. All of these um, functions are impaired. And it may be that we'll be able to improve the function using the glycomimetics. So how will this work in the clinic? We may be able to isolate the cells, treat them in, in, in an in vitro situation, expand them in culture, and return them to the patient. Or we may be able to deliver through a, uh, through a wound dressing approach, deliver the glycomimetics directly to the uh, diabetic wound and increase blood flow to the damaged tissue, 
improve wound healing, reduce amputations, enhance patients' qualities of life. Very sort of noble ideas. And we're getting a lot of work published in this, it seems to be, um, and Alex actually won a, a prize for, for, that, um, for that work that he did. So um, it's clearly, dare I say, cutting edge. Um, but we are moving in the right direction, where we're trying to understand disease, trying to develop therapeutics. And so over the course of the past um, 70 years, we've really seen the evolution of healthcare. We started out in the 50s, where Watson and Crick won a Nobel Prize for their uh, discovery of the structure of DNA. In the 90s, we had the Human Genome Project, where we are understanding disease at the genetic level now. And I predict that by 2025 or 2035 or 45, uh, there will be the implementation of precision medicine, uh, where we're treating the right patient at the right time. Um, uh, and uh, this really has shown a sort of paradigm shift in medicine. Yesterday, it was all symptom-based, intuitive medicine. Today, it's pattern-based, evidence-based medicine. Tomorrow, it's going to be algorithm-based and precision medicine. And this is not a new concept, actually. It's quite an old concept. Way back, 100 years ago, Landsteiner um, received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his work on blood typing. Now, typing, uh, we have eight blood types and uh, can all be categorized into these blood types. But why are we now thinking about precision medicine? Well, the time is right because we've sequenced the human genome. We've got improved by, uh, technologies for biomedical analysis and we have nine tools for um, analyzing large data sets. We are now empowering people to, um, to sort of look after their own health, but also to record certain things and um, give that information to, uh, to the doctors. So precision medicine is not a one size fits all medicine. It's taking individual patients and now they can be categorized into breast cancer, prostate cancer, brain tumors, and so on. It's a little bit more complex in the cardiovascular field, but the cardiovascular field is learning a lot from the oncology um, world and developing a personalized medicine approach. So how are we translating this and how are we building a platform where we can move towards precision medicine? We've got all the clinical data. We're collecting samples and analyzing these. We've got our animal models and our cell models. Taking this data and using these high-tech um, um, approaches of all the omic technologies that allow us to dissect out all the various aspects of um, uh, molecular disease phenotypes. We're in the era of internet and um, uh, data database building and data mining. Using bioinformatics and statistical analysis, we can create these um, models and then go back to validate the models that have been created through all this information technology and develop new uh, biomarkers, therapeutics, and patient stratification. So I think we're very much in a time of combining science and digital um, technology. We're still understanding, we've still a lot to learn about disease, but we're combining this with machine learning approaches and biostatistical methods. We are now creating novel medical devices and empowering people to look after their own health. We've got these little glucose um, detectors um, where people can do a little blood um, finger prick and detect their own glucose levels. We have now got apps where people can look after their cardiovascular health and risk. Um, creating these algorithms for diagnostic, prognostic and therapeutic purposes. So we're combining science with healthcare professionals and taking the patient-driven data, creating these apps, and engaging with the public to, um, to supply the information and uh, to trust this sort of uh, the way forward with, um, with disease understanding. So we're really looking at molecular diagnostics for personalized medicine. So I think it's very much a unified approach now. We're looking not just at individual projects in the lab. It's really a case about networking with others um, combining different disciplines together. We're taking the genetic approach, the metabolomic. We all know about our sort of metabolism is different. Some people can eat, you know, a few bars of chocolate and never put on an ounce of weight. Others have to just look at a bar of chocolate and put on half a stone. Why is that? It's because our metabolism is different. And so using metabolomics and understanding why we are sort of different in that way and metabolizing things differently, combining that with our sort of genes, diet, lifestyle, and environment, 
We are screening people much earlier, much quicker and faster, and being able to diagnose disease a lot better. And I do believe that the way forward is personalizing medicine. We're very fortunate here in Manchester to be one of the epicenters of precision medicine. We've got all of these funding bodies um, funding our basic science. We have centers of clinical excellence here in Manchester with six uh, NHS trusts, and they're being funded and supported by the Department of Health and NHS England, among others. And we also have sustainable services. The government have invested in Innovate UK and Catapult Digital, as, among others. And these, fund, these bodies are supporting the development and the translation of science into the clinic. And so looking at the five-year forward view of the NHS, they want to build the resources and populations and patients, continue with the clinical and molecular characterization of disease. We're generating a lot of knowledge on gene and protein <coughs> levels and characterizing molecular mechanisms. And this will have undoubtedly an, a great impact in healthcare. And when I showed you at the beginning that it took 27 years to develop that sort of Parkinson's disease clinical trial, I think with the technology that we have today, things will move at a much faster rate. And so I would like to finish with this um, quote fr from, a, an, a, from the, the, one of our great old leaders, uh, that you only have to endure to conquer. And I think endurance is another key element to um, being able to conquer uh, success in science. It's a difficult time sometimes, well, I guess in every walk of life there are you know, ups and downs, and it's hard to take the rejections of papers and the rejections of grant applications and so on. But if you endure and you have enthusiasm, I think then that we will conquer and the rewards that we reap when we get our papers published, when we get our prizes at conferences, and when we get our grants awarded, they far outweigh the down times. And so I'd like to thank the funding bodies that have funded all my research over the past 25, 30 years, and uh, all the people that I've worked with. I have really enjoyed my, um, my journey to where I am today, and it's all been down to the people that I have worked with. I've worked with some great people. And uh, I'd like to point out my sort of current group. Um, this is probably a little bit old, old now. We need to get an updated one. But uh, I've worked with some great people. And uh, I can't finish without saying the support of my family as well. Um, my three children and uh, their partners, uh, they grew up with me talking science when I came home in the evenings, and my husband. He was a great inspiration to me and has been a real support throughout my whole career. And I think that is also another key element to success in a career, is having the support around you from friends and family. Thank you. Great, Yvonne, really inspiring. Any questions for Yvonne? Blind in the wall of science. <laughs> <laughs> so, with the biomedical markers, uh, you were talking in specific clinics. Are you envisaging some of those going into the more general uh, biomedical labs? Well, I mean, there's a lot of diagnostic um, tools available, and I think um, there are in place in the pathology labs a lot of the um, screening things. And I think some of these biomarkers will be specific as we learn more about them for specific diseases. I mean, I saw the obvious problem if you're actually looking for markers within the normal range, which really looking at the general population, which is quite, quite difficult to the uh, You mean in the screening of uh, healthy people? to see whether they will go on. Yes, I guess that's too early to sort of detect whether they're going to go on. It'll probably be the combination of um, maybe the genetic influence as well, when you combine that um, before, the, before the onset of disease. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, it will be, yeah. Okay. I've been asking a lot of questions. Just one on a couple of slides he showed which of arteries with blood vessels inside. Yeah. And um, some of them were active and some of them weren't. Yeah. So I guess because it's a snapshot uh, in time. Yes. You know, there's an active part and a part which was active at some point. Yeah. Otherwise the vessel wouldn't be there. Yeah. So I'm not sure <coughs> sort of how important it is to identify the currently active part. Where where do you think the vessels come from? Yeah, well I guess this is like um this new idea of neovascularization. Now, it's a bone of contention among uh, the scientists. 
Some believe that it is from these circulating progenitor cells that actually, and I can actually show some blood vessels with progenitor cell markers on those cells. Um, so we do think that new blood vessels are just being formed uh, from those circulating cells. Other people think that it's a process of angiogenesis where it's um, created from the existing blood vessels. But I would go along with the neovascularization like that's formed from the progenitor cells. Yeah, 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 so I tend to agree with you, but also some of the work in the body one yeah. center. Yeah. They just show cells tracking through from the vasovasorum into a plaque. Oh, yeah. So oh yeah. It, yeah. So there. So as well as the circulating cells, I do think that there's resident cells as well yeah. in the in in that outside. Do you remember I sort of showed a slide with the endothelial layer and the adventitia, the outside layer. I think there's resident stem cells in that, and they are triggered once they sort of know they get the trigger and they migrate in and they will go in and form new blood vessels as well. And do you think if you could block that process completely, that would slow down or stop the, the development? Uh, well, uh, it's whether you're going to target the pathological angiogenesis that occurs in the plaque or whether you're going to target the therapeutic angiogenesis that you want to occur in ischemic tissue. So I think, yeah, maybe, um, um, well, we're hoping <laughs> that keeps us in a job where we're trying to sort of target and maybe prevent and block that um, buildup of plaque in that case, in the, patho in the pathological sort of sense. And in the therapeutic, we want to sort of encourage the growth. So, so that's for the sort of next 20 years that uh, the group will be continuing on. I think there's plenty of work for everybody to do. Great. Jamie. Jamie. <coughs> um, it might be a, an obvious question, but these circulating biomarkers that, that you're looking at, are they any more predictive than the obvious biomarkers that would be, say, age or body fatness or BMI or sedentary living for predicting? It's a good question. Um, I guess it's only through understanding what their role is. Um, because we can screen so many more proteins now, I mean, there's the obvious ones. People are sort of, there's routine ones that are used in the lab, troponin C and CRP and everything else. But they're clearly not doing the job as efficiently as they could be. And so we need a greater understanding of all the different molecules. And so I think it's a combination. And that's why I so showed that panel. I think we will have a chip where there's maybe 50 proteins on. And depending on whether you're going to, it's a little bit like when you get an allergy test, you have a little sort of, you've got about 10 dots. And uh, you can sort of identify one or two. And then you say, yes, you're allergic to eggs and you're allergic to butter. And so I think it'll be something like that, where there will be a chip with you know, and you just put a blood sample on and you'll be able to screen lots of different ones, put it into a sort of an algorithm and say, your such and such a protein is up, you, this other one's down, and then that will be able to sort of uh, combine that with maybe your genetic makeup. I think it's, it sounds futuristic, but I think it will, you know, the, the engineers and the machine learners and mathematical modelers will be able to develop that through all the big data that we're able to acquire now, because we can look at about 200 you know, proteins in the, in the blood, and, and uh, by screening out all the ones that maybe are just background noise, and some that are really key, then uh, you know, I think that's, that's probably the way forward. Sure. One last question. Um, how long will the effects of gene therapy last? Oh, that's a good question too. That was always one of the problems, the duration of gene expression. And I haven't stayed really in that sort of field of transferring genes, but um, uh, depending on the disorder and depending on the um, disease, I think that uh, people have been looking at that and there has been some um, improvement in duration because you can get these stabilizing elements on genes. And so, um, and, and there's also control elements. There's a much greater understanding of gene expression. And so by putting in control elements, you can actually switch genes on and off. So um, I think the field has moved on, and especially now with CRISPR-Cas9, I think uh, it's, you know, we're going to be looking at being able to, you know, correct certain genetic defects. And uh, there'll be a greater understanding of that sort of duration of gene expression. Thanks very much. Yvonne, thank you very much for a really inspiring lecture. Thank you. Yvonne's a really active member of our staff and a great mentor. And we see you've got future profs from her group that are going to come through and it's a great privilege to have Yvonne at NMU.
So I'd like to thank everyone, but after that side we've got some, some drinks and we'll have a chat with everyone. But you're on, thanks very much. Thank you.